Good morning and thank you everybody for coming and thanks again to Professor Hopper and the Property and Freedom Society for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to discuss the topic of interest rates on a free market. Now, historically, interest is perhaps one of the most controversial economic and uh, moral topics in general. In monotheistic religions and in Buddhism and in all kinds of different philosophers' works across time, people have had bad things to say about interest. And religions have forbidden it in many cases and they've described it as being as bad as murder in some cases. And uh, we see this repeated across cultures, across time and across space, which is really curious. Um, but within the religious um, invocations against uh, usury and against interest, Rothbard argues there is nothing in the Gospels of the early fathers, despite their hostility to trade, that can be construed as urging the prohibition of usury. I'm not entirely sure how much, um, how accurate this is, but I'm going to take Rothbard's word for it. And the prohibition of usury first came in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, and then in the 5th century, Pope Leo extended it to the laity, and then Charlemagne in 789 AD made, uh, passed, was the first secular legislator to ban usury. Now, these um, are not exactly arguments, they are uh, bans, but in terms of arguments against usury, uh, Rothbard in the history of economic thought has a good discussion of the evolution of this argument. So Aristotle offered an argument saying that usury is hated because its gain comes from money itself and not from that for the sake of which money was invented. For money was brought into existence for the purpose of exchange, but interest increases the amount of the money itself, consequently, this form of the business of getting wealth is, all, is of all forms the most contrary to nature. This isn't very compelling, and Rothbard and many other economists have offered good arguments against it. Just because something was invented for one purpose doesn't mean it can't be used for another purpose. And the idea that um, just uh, money not having any use in something else is somehow forbidden a lot of things get used for other things. So it's not very convincing. Aquinas had a uh, convoluted argument against interest, where he argued that since, food, since money is like food and that it is consumed when it is used, it makes no sense to pay if you're going to return it. If you're going to return it, it's a consumable good, so you've already returned the same thing. It makes sense to charge rent on, in his opinion, things that are not consumed, like a house, because you return the house, but you don't consume it during its use, so you have to pay a rent on it. And that also doesn't make a lot of sense, because people can charge prices for all kinds of things, and when people charge prices in general, they charge them based on subjective valuation of the sum of all the services that the good renders. So it's not entirely convincing to say that people shouldn't be able to charge for something for which others are willingly paying. Another argument is that it is maybe immoral to not share risk for the lender and the borrower to not share the risk equally because the borrower bears the risk while the lender only shares in the upside. But if this is immoral, then why do borrowers accept it willingly? Rothbard goes through a lot of these arguments and I think the very powerful argument against them is that people continue to find ways to introduce interest. So throughout the Middle Ages, even though a lot of places had banned interest, there were all kinds of creative arrangements that uh, merchants came up with to introduce interest into the contract without making it look to the church authorities that this was uh, interest. And then Rothbard provides some of the arguments from um, scholastics and Calvinist priests and scholars on the uh, problem of interest. And so Cardinal Hostianesis in the 13th century introduce the concept of opportunity cost, that when you're lending money, you're foregoing the ability to make returns on investments yourself, and for that, uh, the people require a compensation for lending. In the 15th century, there was a, com a complete refutation of the arguments according to Rothbard, and then in the, uh, there was the argument that liquidity has its value, and so foregoing liquidity um, requires the person charging. John Calvin argued that money is not sterile, contrary to Aristotle, because it generates profits through trade. And then Rothbard says, the Dutch Calvinist Claude Somme's 
put the final nail in the coffin. Money lending is a business like any other. And so just like people spend time and effort in order to provide apples or wheat or meat for the market, people will also spend time and effort to try and provide capital for the market. And so they require compensation for it. And Rothbard says, on uh, some ways, he did make the important theoretical point, however, that as in any other part of the market, if the number of users multiplies, the price of money or interest will be driven down by the competition, so that if one doesn't like high interest rates, the more users, the better. And I think this is a very interesting line of thought, which we're going to get back to later in uh, this discussion. Now, in the end of the 18th century, Jeremy Bentham provided the argument, the liberal argument against or, or for interest lending, which is that if some man of sane mind acting freely wants to enter into a particular arrangement with money, there is no good argument for stopping him if he sees that this is beneficial to him. But until here, we see that we haven't really, uh, we haven't really formulated a precise economic argument for interest. They've refuted, all the economists that we've seen, they've refuted some of the fallacious arguments against interest. They've introduced the liberal argument, which is people should be free to do what they want. But there was no clear explanation of why is it economically that, <clears throat> that people engage in interest lending. And for that, we had to wait till Turgot, Bomberic, and Frank Fetter introduced the time preference explanation for interest. So Turgot was the first to bring this up, according to Rothbard. He introduced the concept of subjective valuation to the question. And so the subjective value of the monetary sums is what matters, and not the quantity of metal involved. That was, I think, the key breakthrough in Turgot's work, that it's perfectly normal for somebody to prefer a smaller sum of coins today, 100 coins today, over 110 coins next year, because Valuation is not inherent in the physical coins. Valuation is subjective. And so it might be the case that I value 100 coins today more than I value 110 coins next year. And so therefore, I'm conducting a beneficial trade for myself when I trade taking 100 coins today and then I pay 110 coins next year. So the val the, the, this is basically the concept of time preference. People value a satisfaction today more than they value the same satisfaction in the future. So once you accept that value is subjective and that people value things subjectively, it's perfectly normal to understand that they would value a smaller sum more than a larger sum. And that's why they take the loan. That's why they accept the loan. And time preference, later on, Bomberg and Frank Fetter and the Austrian economists would elaborate on this concept more. And I think it is, it, it, it's, it, it's a category of human action. It's something that pervades all of human actions in that we always prefer the present to the future. The present is certain. The future is uncertain. The future can only come by surviving the present. So the present's needs are always more pressing. There's no future if you don't survive to get to the future. So you have to prioritize the present to prioritize your survival. And the present is where all the senses experience life. It's where you experience pleasure and pain and all of the uh, sensations that drive us toward action. So time preference is always positive, but it varies between people and it varies in the same person at different times. So your time preference is constantly changing throughout life due to the conditions and the circumstances of life. But the fact that the valuation differs between people, and the fact that people have different valuations of time, means that people are capable of having a market in their differing valuations of time. So people will only be willing to give up a resource if repaid with a larger sum in the future because they have a positive time preference. But if they find somebody who has a different valuation, then there's a trade opportunity. The higher a person's time preference, the higher the interest rate that they would like to accept in order to give up consumption today. And of course, since people have different time preference, then there will be an opportunity for trade. So time preference being positive always creates an originary interest in every person. Every one of us has an originary interest, which is the uh, driver of the phenomena of the market rate of interest. And in the Austrian tradition, they distinguish between the market interest rate and the originary interest rate. So the originary interest rate is the degree to which you discount goods in the future compared to today. So it's a rate of discounting.
that is inherent to you, or I shouldn't say inherent, that is uh, personal to you and subjective, and it reflects a total discounting of all goods and all satisfactions, including money. And so the fact that people have different originary interests means that there is an opportunity for them to trade with one another. So somebody with a higher time preference can pay money to someone with a lower time preference in exchange for borrowing a sum of money today. And so this creates a lending market and a general market interest rate. The fact that people can look at other people's time preference and see that there is a discrepancy between mine and his creates an opportunity for me and him to trade together and both benefit from him because I can sell him um, money today that he values more than the money that he, was, he, is, he will pay back next year. And for me, I value the money next year more than I value the money today. And the reason for that is that I have a lower discounting of the future than he does. So he might be in a position where he needs the money right now because he's got an emergency. So he's got a much higher time preference. So he's willing to pay a sum that would allow me and justify for me the choice of foregoing the liquidity for that period of time. So this then creates a lending market because it's not just individuals trading together. Then there becomes a lending market, which is like a market for time. And that market will then have a general market interest rate, which is the sum, if you want, of all of the um, market uh, originary interests and the contributions of the people. And as Hoppe describes it in Democracy, the God that Failed, this market determined interest rate is the aggregate sum of all individual time preference rates, reflecting the social rate of time preference and equilibrating social savings, i.e. the supply of present goods offered for exchange against future goods, and social investment, i.e. the demand for present goods thought capable of yielding future returns. So the time preference of people is what shapes the market interest rate. So market interest rates have their origin in human action, and in particular in the discounting that humans place on the future. And so as Rothbard as elaborates in Man, Economy and State, the function of the capitalist in the market economy is a time function. Their income is precisely an income representing the agio of present as compared to future goods. This interest income then is not derived from the concrete heterogeneous capital goods, but from the generalized investment of time. And this is the essence of the time pre Austrian time preference theory of interest, in that it's not the productivity of goods which gives the interest income. The interest income is the discounting of the future. And so by foregoing the present in order to receive uh, a, a repayment in the future, that is what generates the interest. The, the uh, capitalist who provides the capital foregoes consumption and provides the factors necessary for the producers in order to produce output that is only going to generate income in the future. So this settled the debate in favor of interest, I think, because it's a very clear idea about why interest emerges. And if you provide a, an economic and practical, logical explanation for why interest is just another naturally emergent market, then it's very difficult to argue that you can have markets in uh, everything, but you can't have markets in uh, interest. They're all uh, market goods, and they can all be utilized and uh, traded. And so therefore, the objection to interest uh, bans is, was, I would say, completely weakened after this uh, development. Effectively, to oppose usury or to oppose the interest lending is to deny originary interest, which would imply difference between receiving a good today or in 10 years, which would imply indifference between receiving a good today or in 10 years. So if you think that you, it's not okay for people to accept interest on money, then effectively you're saying it's not okay for people to have a preference between a good today and a good from 10 years. So you would be indifferent if I borrowed your laptop you would be indifferent between me returning it tomorrow or me returning it in 10 years. This is what it says to oppose the market for interest lending. So this, in my mind, explains why people constantly find ways to introduce interest to their contracts, because it's based in human action, in human preferences, and in human discounting of the future. And so therefore, they're always going to find a way because it's mutually beneficial for both parties to get into it. Now, what does it mean when we say that interest rates are determined by time preference, but we know 
and Professor Hopper describes it in, um, also in Democracy That God That Fails, we know interest rates historically have been declining. What does that mean? As Professor Hopper says, it's a, tend a tendency toward falling interest rate characterizes mankind's suprasecular trend of development. Whereas high or rising minimum interest rates indicate periods of generally low or declining living standards, the overriding opposite tendency toward low and falling interest rates reflects mankind's overall progress, its advance from barbarism to civilization. Historically, we see that time preference declines in periods of declining, uh, of increasing prosperity. People's time preference declines, so they save more. Because we save more, capital becomes more abundant. Because we have more capital, we're able to invest more. Productivity goes up. Our ability to provide for the future increases. And that all reduces our time preference. So prosperity and civilization, as Professor Hoppe uh, describes it, is what initiates the process of, uh, sorry, declining time preference is what initiates the process of civilization. We can think of civilization as the decline in time preference. So then, the question also raised in uh, Democracy, the God That Failed, with this historical backdrop, and in accordance with economic theory then, it should be expected that 20th century interest rates would be still lower than 19th century interest rates. But that is not the case. Interest rates were the lowest in history recorded at the beginning of the 20th century, around 2.5%. That was the uh, interest rate of the Bank of England. So this was the lowest interest rate that humanity had ever seen at 2.5%. And if civilizational progress had continued in the 20th century, you would have expected that rate to decline. Now it did not. And as Professor Hopper says, you can only explain that by saying the character of the population must have changed. People on the average must have lost in moral and intellectual strength and become more present oriented. Indeed, this appears to be the case. I think anybody who's been familiar with the 20th century would argue that there must have been some element of uh, rise in time preference. And I think that's reflected in the interest rates. And uh, Professor Hopper focuses on the role of democracy on that, and I think that's a very good point. And I like to focus on the role of fiat money, and the value on the money that is constantly being devalued, because the money is declining in its value. It uh, doesn't provide people a, a good mechanism for saving for the future, so people's ability to provide for their future becomes more difficult, so the future becomes more uncertain, so people start discounting the future more. I think this and democracy are, um, of course, related explanations, because it was democracy that gave us fiat money, and it's fiat money that gave us democracy. It's a chicken and egg uh, problem. But the uh, end result of this is there's been a rise in time preference. The time preference has been rising. So this introduces a very interesting question. What would happen if time preference continued to decline from the beginning of the 20th century until today? What would happen if time preference had continued to decline? Imagine if we hadn't had the horrible things of the 20th century happen. It's a very interesting question. It's so interesting that it is actually my next book, The Gold Standard. It's an economic fictional book written in, at the end of the 20th century in which fiat money dies in 1915 and the world goes back to the gold standard throughout the 20th century. And so to try and imagine what would have happened to human civilization throughout the century if fiat money died in 1915, World War I ends and then we have uh, peace and there is an international order based around self-determination that um, dominates the world and then eventually most conflicts get resolved in a civilized way because everybody votes for self-determination and we have a gold standard and we have free trade. What would have happened in a world like this? Well, I've written a whole book on this which will be available in a couple of months um, on imagining all of these kind of thought experiments in all aspects of economics. But the one that we're going to focus on for today would have to be the uh, topic of uh, time preference and interest. So at the beginning of the 20th century, we started with a 2.5% interest rate. Now since then, if you have more capital accumulation, we don't have a, a first world war that destroys enormous amounts of capital. We don't have all of these communist leftist revolutions that were all um, running on central bank and fiat money and destroyed enormous amounts of capital and murdered tens of millions of people. So we just continue to accumulate capital. 
and we don't murder tons of millions of people every uh, decade um, because governments don't have money printers that allow them to engage in so much murder. And so what happens? As capital accumulates, time preference declines. People have a lower originary interest. Eventually, originary interest, the degree of discounting of the future in individuals, must fall under the cost of holding capital. If time preference keeps declining as we advance as a civilization, we accumulate more capital, we become um, more future-oriented, we accumulate more capital, time preference continues to decline, originary interest declines, eventually it declines under the cost of holding capital. So then what happens? Well, the, there's always a cost for holding capital. Uh, st storing money, or I should say holding money, not holding capital. Storing money um, in any form or shape is going to require a cost, whether it's done at a bank or at a uh, storage facility. And it's true for all forms of money, whether it's paper money, government debt, digital money, you're putting it in a bank, or um, uh, physical gold or Bitcoin, whatever form of money is, there is a cost involved with storing it. So I think if you think about the cost of storing it in terms of the um, cost, direct monetary cost for paying for the storage, there's also the second aspect of it, which is the risk of it getting lost, which is another cost. There's always a risk that it could get lost or stolen or damaged or destroyed in a certain way. And so that is a non-zero cost that, uh, that is part of holding it. So if you combine the fact that holding money has a non-zero cost with the fact that the originary interest is declining, eventually the originary interest must decline under the cost of holding money, at which point lending the money out for a 0% nominal interest rate becomes preferable to holding the money. Because holding the money implies a cost, but lending the money implies no storage cost. So at some point, the interest rate can decline under the cost of holding the money. So if originary interest is lower than the cost of holding money, a 0% nominal interest rate is acceptable for the lender. So keep in mind in this situation, we have already assumed that there is a very low time preference. And I think that can only happen in a situation where we have a form of money that is hard, that is capable of maintaining its value into the future. So it would have to be something like gold or Bitcoin, but not fiat money, not highly inflationary fiat money. So that form of money would appreciate just by being held. So a 0% nominal interest rate is a positive real interest rate because over time, money is the scarcest good. It's the good that's being produced at the low, in the lowest quantities. And therefore, it's the good that is going to be uh, appreciating most over time. So simply holding on to money provides you an appreciation. But holding on to money also involves a cost of storage and risk of damage or theft or loss. So lending the money allows you to reap the benefit from its appreciation. If you get it back at 0%, you reap the benefit from the appreciation, but you don't pay the cost of the storage of money. So this would mean a nominal 0% interest rate. And one way of thinking of it is that if capital is abundant, if capital is very abundant, then zero is the ultimate end price for capital. So the price approaches zero, doesn't quite get to zero because time preference is never zero, is never zero. time preference is always positive, but it approaches zero and then because the cost of storing money is larger than zero, then it doesn't really need to go to zero because the nominal interest rate will just still be zero um, and the real rate will be positive. So if time preference is very low for everyone, then there is no market in time valuation. So if we understand the economic argument for interest, it is that there is a differential in time preference, and it's the differential in time preference that creates the market in interest, which is the market in valuation of time. But if everybody's time preference is so low that their originary interest is lower than the cost of holding capital, then there's no market to be had in valuations of time. Everybody has a very, very low time preference and so the, dis the distinctions in time preference are very tiny that the lending just happens at the 0% rate because it's better than the cost of holding capital. So in this kind of world, you would expect that interest lending would be replaced by two processes. One, 0% nominal loans, likely for friends and family for consumption. So if you know somebody 
and you trust them and they need money for consumption, you're willing to give up the money for 0% interest loan because A, the money is extremely abundant for most people, so there's likely going to be somebody willing to give up that money. And if you um, trust, you have a very high degree of uh, trust in the person being able to repay the money, then you would get, uh, you would be willing to give the money without any return. But you would imagine that for business needs, you would give money with equity. It wouldn't make sense that you would give money and get a 0% nominal return, even though it's positive. In real terms, it could be more positive if the business is profitable. And since with this situation you're sharing in the downside, you would likely anticipate a sharing in the upside. So we would witness interest rate lending bifurcate into two processes, which, which also exist today, which is equity investment and 0% nominal loans. Now, the question here is, does this destroy capital? Is this going to be bad for capital accumulation? I don't think that is the case because it's not through the creation of credit that capital is created. Credit creation merely reallocates capital. It does not create it. capital. What creates capital is saving. What creates capital is the foregoing of consumption. So we've already assumed that interest rates are extremely low to the point where they're under the cost of storing money. So that necessarily implies, as a premise, that capital is already abundant. So in a situation in which capital is abundant and time preference is very low, generating more credit doesn't necessarily generate more capital, doesn't generate capital, it just reallocates the capital. So if credit investment can allocate capital, equity investment can also allocate capital, with both parties sharing in the upside and the downside. So what is this, um, what is this telling us in, in light of the um, religious and cultural and philosophical arguments against usury historically? Is there a way to salvage perhaps these in a sense? What would a very low time preference society look like? Imagine a society in which everybody's time preference is so low that there is very little room for a market in um, the time of capital, in, in time and capital. But a very low so time preference society is one that is civilized, peaceful, cooperative, and low on conflict and aggression. And essentially, you could argue that that's what religions try to create. Religion in general can be understood as an attempt to bring time preference down by making people think of the long-term consequences of their action. And so a very low time preference society is going to be a society that is similar to what religions are generally attempting to preach. And then you can perhaps then make sense of the abolition of usury in that a very low time preference society would end up with no uh, market for capital. So, but in this sense, religions banning or um, trying to discourage usury is, can perhaps be understood as the attempt to bring time preference down so low that the market in usury decline, uh, disappears. But this is a very interesting question now because the prohibition of usury could be counterproductive to its elimination. In the same way as any kind of price control is generally counterproductive to the goals of the people who try and impose it, you could argue the same thing here. Prohibiting usury discourages the accumulation of capital and the, market, and the natural, market-driven, sustainable lowering of its price. Similar to price controls after a disaster. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the arguments that are usually given for price controls. When there's a disaster in an area, there's a shortage of food because there's been a destruction of infrastructure, and it's very difficult to get food into this place because the highways and the trains or the airport are not working. In this situation, the price of food rises. Now, politicians usually respond by saying, uh, but by imposing price controls on food. What does that do? The fact that there's a price control now makes it more unlikely that people in other places will try and bring food to this disaster-stricken area. If the price of food was very high, people would bring food from the faraway towns that haven't been affected by the disaster, and they'd drive and bring the food and sell it because it would be worth it. And what happens when more and more people bring in food, the price of food goes down. But more concretely and more uh, importantly, it's not just that people will bring in food, it's also that people will then have money to invest in rebuilding the infrastructure that is needed for bringing in food.
So then you'll have the highways and the trains and the airplanes and the airports being re renovated and, uh, re uh, and, and brought back into service, which brings the food down. If you ban uh, price gouging, you discourage the incentive to invest in bringing food. And so you discourage the incentive of bringing the price of food down. Could there be an analogy here to usury that when uh, you ban interest lending, you discourage people from saving their money because there's less of a return expected on the saving of money. And so people are more likely to consume. So a religious ban of usury might be counterproductive. And so the, if, if usury is instead allowed, people can then effectively monetize their lower time preference, which encourages and rewards time preference to the point where it could eventually, if we can keep up civilization going long enough perhaps, bring down or eliminate usury. So we have this paradox wherein the economist who explained why usury is a necessary part of a market process can also give us a process for seeing how it can be eliminated out of the market naturally just through the uh, decline in time preference. Whereas the religious argument for banning usury ironically ends up causing it perhaps to continue because it discourages the saving and accumulation of capital that would be necessary to bring interest rates down. Thank you very much. Thank you.